I'm a big believer that when it comes to relationships, you have to find someone you can be yourself around. That's why I've partnered with eHarmony for this episode. eHarmony does a lot to understand what it's like to be single or in a relationship today. In one of their recent research studies, they found that over half of dating app users believe the apps are less authentic today. In fact, 54% of dating app users agree there's a lack of authenticity. Two thirds of daters say that having a profile that accurately captures who they are and attracts the kind of people they're looking for is a top priority. When it comes to connection, we want someone who truly gets us, not just certain parts of us. If we're going to make better connections, we'll have to give people a better sense of who we are too. eHarmony helps you create a profile that shows the real you. Their well-rounded personality quiz helps you find someone who will really get you. I love how eHarmony goes above and beyond to make connections. So join the dating app that gets to know their users better so they can match better and see for yourself. Get someone who gets you. Start a conversation on eHarmony today. Did you know that shipping costs are the number one cause of abandoned carts? Not surprised. I will put tons of expensive things in my online basket. Once I see a cost for shipping, I leave them there. In a landscape where free and fast shipping is the norm, it can be hard for smaller e-commerce businesses to compete. Keep yourself competitive with ShipStation. I love how easy ShipStation makes it to get my products to my customers. Keep growing your business all year long with ShipStation. Use promo code RESPECT today at ShipStation.com to sign up for your free 60-day trial. That's ShipStation.com, promo code RESPECT. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and those who don't identify as either, you are listening to Ratchet and Respectable. I'm back in Johannesburg. It's good to be home. I was out in the middle of the bush. I did eight game drives over five days. It was amazing. But I was technically on vacation, but I didn't get no sleep because I had to be up at 4 a.m. to to get ready to go see the animals at 5 every day. So I didn't really get the good sleep that you would think. I told myself I was going to be in bed every day by 8, but then the afternoon game drive doesn't start till 4.30. We get back at 7.30. I go and clean myself up because I've been out in the bush driving around and open vehicles all day. Like, it's dusty and smelly and, and all of those things. So then I go to dinner. By the time I'm finished, it's already 10. Best case scenario, if I go right to sleep, I'm only getting six hours of sleep by the time I get up to go see the animals. And yes... I could have skipped the morning game drive, but then miss an opportunity to see leopards or rhinos or a giraffe? Never. Never. So I've been sleeping a bunch since I got back to Johannesburg on Sunday. I'm only here for, what, tonight? And then I head out again in the morning. I'm going to Cape Town, and I'll be there for two weeks. I had this revelation the other day. Actually, when I was at the, um, the game drive, I stayed at this really dope hotel, Kruger Shalanti. A couple people wrote in to me and said it was featured on some travel show. It's a really unique hotel. The hotel is actually a refurbished train. Like every room is a refurbished train car. And the hotel, the train, is parked on a bridge over a river in the middle of Kruger Park. So on a train, and then there's water with animals in it. Like I was seeing hippos and and either alligator or crocodile. I don't really know the difference. I could see them swimming around or hanging out on the beach from my hotel room. Like, it was really beautiful. But I was so damn happy when I was there. And I was like, why am I so giddy here in a way that I'm not in Johannesburg? And there's nothing wrong with Johannesburg. I mean, the energy thing, I'm currently sitting in the dark as I record this. But the energy thing is getting better. The power only goes out twice a day for two hours as opposed to four times a day twice for two hours, twice for four hours. It was really bad at one point. We're we're on the upswing. But other than that, like I really like Johannesburg, but I just don't have that zip and that zing. And it hit me the other day. I've never lived anywhere that's landlocked. I am a water sign. I am a cancer. I need to be near large bodies of water in order to like, I don't know, feel at my best. I was like, it's not Johannesburg. It's actually me. And then it dawned on me that every excursion that I've taken in the last six weeks that I've been here has been to some place near water. In six weeks, I've been to Cape Town twice. Cape Town is right on the water. I went to Victoria Falls, literally the largest falling body of water in the world. 
And then when I go to Kruger, of all the hotels, I pick one that's on a bridge over a river in the middle of the bush. I need water. Something that I knew that I enjoyed, I don't think I fully understood like how important it was to my overall well-being. I actually really enjoyed Johannesburg. I just don't know if I could ever hit a 10 here solely because of the water. Who knew? I find it so fascinating that I'm still discovering very basic things about myself at like, what am I, 43? There's so much going on in the world. I don't even know where to start. I guess we should start with good black news. That's where we usually start. Good black news gets weird this week, though. We need to talk about Cheryl Lee Ralph and Michelle Obama. USA Today has named both of them Woman of the Year. USA Today honored 10 women, of which Cheryl Lee Ralph and Michelle Obama are two of the 10. The other women aren't black. Congratulations to everyone, but you know what this show is. Michelle Obama, I mean, this is going to sound really bad. I want her to get all the flowers and all the honors and everything that she deserves. She's been honored 50 million times. I feel like Cheryl Lee Ralph is having a moment. This is not her first rodeo. This is not the first time she's been awarded. She's experienced great things before, but I think she's on a, a career high right now with, you know, her awards and the Super Bowl and now Woman of the Year for USA Today. I'm just so pleased for her. I know if Bevy was here, she'd be screaming, it gets greater later. People tend to think your life is over at... It's not even 40. It's like people think your life is over at 35. If you haven't accomplished everything that you set out to do by 35, then it's all downhill from there. And I'm like, where do people get that shit? I don't know. Let Cheryl Lee Ralph be a living testament. That it gets greater later. But people like Cheryl Lee Ralph and Bevy too. I, I watch them. Bevy closer up because she's a personal friend, but Cheryl Lee Ralph from a distance. One of the reasons I don't have a fear of aging where I'm just like, yeah, I'm 43. Like, yeah, I'm turning 44. Like, eh, and... I see so many women who have some years on me living their absolute best lives. I was like, is that where I'm headed? If I keep a level head, a humble heart and do the work, is that where I go? I'm fine with that. But yeah, congratulations to Cheryl Lee Ralph. I'm so happy for all the good things that are coming for her. I'm not so happy about Judge Joe Brown. Cheryl Lee Ralph did a a podcast interview. I think it was on Angela Yee's show. But she was talking about being in the industry forever and a day. She's had, what, like a 40-year run? Over 40 years, I think, of consistent work in theater and film and TV. But she was talking to Angela Yee about, you know, ups and downs of the industry. And she shared a story about a TV judge, not Judge Mathis, she specifically said, who had assaulted her. She was working for a network. I don't believe she said which one. I believe she was at work when this occurred. But she said this this TV judge came up behind her, turned her around and like shoved his tongue down her throat. She said there were witnesses. People saw it. And she was like the network strongly discouraged her from making a big deal about it. And the witnesses didn't want to you know, say anything. But she was like, this is how Hollywood works. So when she first told the story, people were very upset. And they were like, well, if you're going to tell the story, then you need to say who it was. I saw people say that she was, you know, she's protecting him. And I was like, there are a myriad of reasons that women don't come forward about abuse, assaults. We'll talk about Jonathan Majors. That's the big story about assault right now. We'll talk about that a little later in the episode. But there's so many reasons that women don't come forward. But one of them is, look at what happened when this, with this incident with Jonathan Majors. Alleged. I guess on Saturday night, it was Sunday for me when I heard the story. He was accused by a woman who may or may not have been his girlfriend. I've seen her referred to several different ways. But a woman he was out with on Saturday night accused him of assault. She said that he slapped her. She said also that he strangled her. People heard these allegations and automatically discredited what she said. Based on nothing other than her suspected race. People believe that she's a white woman. And white women in America have a known history of making up shit about black men. So maybe it happened, maybe it didn't. We're all still waiting on evidence. But I use that very current example to explain exactly why Cheryl Lee Ralph would tell the story of saying, this is something that happened to me, this is my experience, but not want to name someone directly. Because what if the person that she named is someone that's very beloved? Then what does that mean? Do people automatically discredit her because they're like, oh, I watched this man on TV for all these years and I think he's a stand up guy and he's a judge. And like, so he would never do the things that you're accusing him of doing. Then people start to go after her. I totally get why she wouldn't say anything. That said, Shirley Ralph never said who the man was. The only TV judge she ruled out was Judge Mathis. 
the internet was doing what the internet does and trying to figure out exactly who she was talking about, they decided it must be Judge Joe Brown. And I was like, Why? how do we arrive at this? They assumed that it must be a black judge. I think they went back and tried to figure out what network show Cheryl Lee Ralph was on 20, 25 years ago, and then tried to piece together which judges had shows on that network. But they arrived at Judge Joe Brown, who had to release a statement to clear his name. Some people thought he just hopped out there and was like, oh, I heard these rumors and I am not the person. In fairness to him, I saw lots of people saying it was probably Judge Joe Brown. But he had to come out and he was like, hey, quote, there's false rumors being spread that I mistreated a certain lady 25 years ago. I categorically deny both the accusations and acquaintance with the lady. Those rumors started with certain identified parties and spread. They ought cease and desist or contemplate a defamation action. Now, a lot of people read that statement and they were like, is, is the judge threatening to sue Cheryl Lee Ralph? Because she didn't say anything. She didn't name him. So what is he talking about with defamation? He's not talking about Cheryl Lee Ralph. He's talking about the bloggers, the podcasters, the random folks on Twitter that keep throwing his name out there, saying or heavily implying that he is the judge that Cheryl Lee Ralph was talking about. So a lot of people were like, Joe Brown is just popping out there. This is some hit dog holler type shit. No, no, it's not. His name was everywhere. And so he addressed it and was like, hey, it's not me. Go look for somebody else. I ain't do nothing to this lady. I think that's fair. If the man fucked up, I'd be the first to be like, nobody said your name and now you jumping out here sounding guilty. Plenty of people said his name. Folks still don't believe him, by the way. But he said it wasn't him. I don't have a reason to doubt it. And Cheryl Lee Ralph ain't confirmed one way or another. This is good news. We got to talk about that Beyonce fashion line. It's very confusing. Okay, we'll get to that. We'll get to it in a minute. Queen Charlotte on Netflix. I saw on the... Essence Black Women in Hollywood, Queen Charlotte had a very prominent space on the step and repeat. I was like, oh, okay, so the marketing team is spending money. There's budget. Okay. I didn't really love the second series of Bridgerton. I watched it and I watched it opening weekend. It was, it was, it was on. The story just didn't connect for me. Like, your sister's in love with this man. I know you got a connection with him, but then you're going to be like messing around with him behind your sister's back. It just, it just really didn't connect for me. So I was a little sour on the whole Bridgerton thing. But I told myself I was really not all that concerned with Queen Charlotte. Look, I like her on the show. I like Lady Dansbury on the show. But I was like, I don't really feel like I need them to have their own breakout show and then like a prequel to Bridgerton at that. I was like, I know you got like this big popping franchise, like you want to make money while it's hot. But I was like, is this the way to go? And I trust Shonda. I trust Shonda's judgment. I saw somebody post the trailer for Queen Charlotte on my Facebook page. Actually, I saw a bunch of people post it. And I was like, all right, let me just look just to see what it is. Let me let me at least like support the black people by giving it a YouTube play. I made it halfway through the trailer and, and literally squealed. It's the queen's hair. Like she just has like this big bountiful afro and it just, just this black woman as queen with this afro and just in the dresses and the, I just got caught up in it. And like midway through the trailer, she knows that she's been appointed to, but she ain't met the king yet. And she's really like freaked out. And she was like, who is this man? Y'all trying to get me to marry? Who is this man? And then George shows up and he's gorgeous. He's white boy gorgeous. Gorgeous. In general, I'm not really attracted to white guys. Like, I I prefer people with melanin. It don't have to be black, but it needs to be with brownness. When I find a white boy attractive, that means he's fine as fuck. George, I was like, oh, hello. Hello, George. Now I'm all sucked into Bridgerton again. I was like, Shonda done got me roped into this shit. I guess I do have a history of liking romance novels and Hallmark stuff. Eh, I got it honest. But I'm super excited about Queen Charlotte now. They didn't really give Lady Dansbury much to do in the trailer. It's supposed to also be about her. And I think the mom from the first Bridgerton, Daphne's mom, which I was like, "Mm, she was interesting. But I was like, a whole show? I mean, obviously the star of the show is Queen Charlotte. But I'm like, for like, like, as a supporting cast, like, do I I care about her story? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I don't know. But I do care about Queen Charlotte and all of her Negro hair. And her big bountiful ball gowns. I'm, I guess I'm easy to please in that way. I love a good period piece. You know how I feel about Gilded Age. Beyonce in this fashion collection. 
We talked about last week that she did a collaboration with Balmain and it was featured in French Vogue. My thought at the time was she and Balmain got together and they created these pieces for Beyonce to wear for her cover story feature in French Vogue. It seems that this collection is not just for the French Vogue shoot. This collection is 16 pieces and it's inspired by Beyonce's Renaissance album. And there is an outfit inspired by every song. Okay, they've made these and I'm reading this on Harper's Bazaar only because the Vogue site wanted me to sign in and do a whole bunch of other shit just to read the article. And I was like, no. Each piece is a one-of-a-kind couture piece directly inspired by a specific Renaissance lyric. So if you go on the Balmain site, it'll show you the outfit and then it'll show you the lyrics that inspired the outfit. Okay. My question though, because they keep calling it a collection and this collaboration and Beyonce times Balmain. And I was like, are you selling this somewhere? Is this going to be available to the masses? I understand you've made these couture pieces for Beyonce. Will you also be producing something that is more affordable? I think is the word I'm looking for, for the masses. Because otherwise, y'all just did this art house collaboration that really only exists in photographs and video. Or I was like, are these the pieces that Beyonce is going to wear on her Renaissance tour? Because that would make sense too. But then it's not being promoted that way. I'm so confused by what this is. And Harper's Bazaar kind of seems to be confused too. Because I'm reading this. And this is on the American Harper's Bazaar. This is the final paragraph of the article. It says, While the entire internet complained over the difficult process of securing tickets to Beyonce's tour, getting your hands on a Balmain times Beyonce look will be infinitely harder. Although it's unclear when that will even be possible. So it appears right now there is no planned rollout for this collection. This was just like, you know, two creatives getting together and made some dope fashion. But but like no one's going to be able to actually access it. Which I was like, there's ways to spend time and money. This is, you know, a choice. I just, I said last episode or at least last week. I was talking about Beyonce and Adidas, and I was like, you know, that never really made sense because, you know, Beyonce's not known for leisure wear. She's known for these over-the-top kind of outfits, which, you know, may or may not be fashionable. That's subjective. But when you think of Beyonce, you think diamonds and glitter and um, expensive and high-end, even if you don't think fashionable, you think money. And so in that sense, I think these pieces that she and Balmain have collaborated on, like, I think they're much more in the lane of Beyonce. But I ain't look at none of them and think like, oh, that shit's dope. Interesting. Artistic. Artistic. Always artistic. But nothing that I was like, oh, you just, you, you breaking the mold. Like, mm, not so much. I swear I like Beyonce. People are like, do you really like Beyonce if you don't like the way she dresses? I like Beyonce music. Ever since she got free from her daddy and stopped doing that weird, like, Madonna whore clash hybrid thing as, as a grown-ass woman. Ever since she got free from her daddy, I've, I've liked all the albums. Which, by the way, still have not listened to Renaissance. The group chat, they're obsessed. And I'd be like, is that on Renaissance? I, I haven't heard it. And they're like, are you kidding me? Still. No. I want my visuals. This Balmain, Beyonce combination, I mean, good for them. I want artists to do artistic shit. Even if I don't love it, I want artists to do artsy things. I just... Maybe if I was looking at these fashions in like a video and had my visuals. We still don't have visuals for this album. And we know some shit was recorded. Like we've seen snippets. We saw behind the scenes footage of like her and Big Frida doing something. Where is the footage? Didn't Beyonce do this a long time ago too? She had a video with Alicia Keys that may or may not have been in Brazil. Am I remembering that correctly? We saw stills from the video. We saw behind the scenes photographs. I don't even think we saw video. We saw photographs. Like we know it exists, but no video ever came out. Like it's just in a vault somewhere. Did you know that shipping costs are the number one cause of abandoned carts? Not surprised. I will put tons of expensive things in my online basket. Once I see a cost for shipping, I leave them there. 
in a landscape where free and fast shipping is the norm, it can be hard for smaller e-commerce businesses to compete. Keep yourself competitive with ShipStation. When you use ShipStation, you can lower shipping costs, make returns easy, and keep your customers happy. And with all the time you save from automating your shipping tasks, you can keep your business growing all year long. Look, running a business can be stressful, but using ShipStation isn't. And right now, they've got a free trial with a super quick setup. So if you've been on the fence about ShipStation, now is the time to give it a try. With the best discounts in the industry, you'll never worry about overpaying for shipping. In fact, you get up to 84% off USPS and UPS rates. And if that's not enough, use my promo code to try ShipStation free for two months. Over 130,000 companies, including Ratchet and Respectable, have grown their e-commerce businesses with ShipStation. And 98% of companies that stick with ShipStation for a year become customers for life. I love how easy ShipStation makes it to get my products to my customers. Keep growing your business all year long with ShipStation. Use promo code RESPECT today at ShipStation.com to sign up for your free 60-day trial. That's ShipStation.com, promo code RESPECT. Looking for meals that are ready to eat, delivered right to your door, and actually help you look and feel your best? Sakara is the answer. And it's so much more than just a meal delivery program. Sakara is a nutrition program that's like having a nutritionist and chef in one. Sakara delivers science-backed, plant-rich nutrition programs and wellness essentials right to your door. Their ready-to-eat meals are nutritionally designed to deliver results from weight management and ease bloat to boosted energy and clearer skin. I love how easy Sakara makes it to eat well so you can feel as good as you look. And right now, Sakara is offering our listeners 20% off their first order when they go to sakara.com slash ratchet or enter code ratchet at checkout. That's Sakara, S-A-K-A-R-A dot com slash ratchet to get 20% off your first order. Sakara.com slash ratchet. This show is brought to you by BetterHelp. Getting to know yourself can be a lifelong process especially because we're always growing and changing. Just recently, I realized how important being near water is to my overall happiness. Therapy is all about deepening your self-awareness and understanding because sometimes we don't know what we want or why we react the way we do until we talk through things. BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist who can take you on that journey of self-discovery from wherever you are. As you know, I'm a huge proponent of therapy. I think everyone should get some and don't wait until things fall apart before you seek professional help. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online and designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. I love how easy BetterHelp makes it for you to get the help that you want and need. Discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Ratchet today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Ratchet. Let's face it, our underarms aren't the only place we have odor. That's why I'm excited to tell you about Lumi Whole Body Deodorant for pits, privates, and beyond. Lumi was created by an OBGYN who discovered and proved in clinical testing that the vagina is not to blame for day-to-day -day odor below the belt. So she developed Lumi, a uniquely formulated pH-balanced deodorant. It's aluminum-free, skin-safe, and clinically proven to control odor for up to 72 hours. Now, I was very skeptical about Lumi. I've been using the same deodorant since I was a kid. I was very nervous about trying something new because what if it didn't work? Well, it's a good thing it did. 
Lumi is a whole body deodorant, the first of its kind, and it's seriously safe to use anywhere on your body. Pits, under boobs, thigh folds, belly buttons, butt cracks, and more. It's clinically proven to block odor all day and control odor for up to 72 hours. Unlike some deodorants that try to mask odor with a fragrance, Lumi is formulated to stop odor before it starts. So it's more like a pre-deodorant. And it comes in a variety of fresh scents like clean tangerine, lavender sage, my personal favorite, and toasted coconut, a close second. Lumi Starter Pack is perfect for new customers. It comes with a solid stick deodorant, cream tube deodorant, two free products of your choice like mini body wash or deodorant wipes, and free shipping. New customers get $5 off a Lumi Starter Pack with code RATCHET at lumideodorant.com. That equates to over 40% of your starter pack when you visit lumideodorant.com and use code RATCHET. LumiDeodorant.com, code Ratchet. Oh, this is still good black news, kind of. CNN's ratings are trash. I'm not making that up. They're experiencing their lowest ratings, I want to say since 2015. I'm typing it in now. CNN ratings drop. Just for clarity, that's not the good news. I'm reading this on Forbes. It says CNN hits 10-year low. February marks CNN's lowest rated month in a decade. With the network's primetime lineup dropping 42% among viewers 25 to 54, which is the key demographic group for advertisers. Ungood. So CNN is obviously trying to turn around their numbers. Apparently, they've been looking at Gail King and Charles Barkley to come aboard to help prop their numbers up. I'm reading this on Deadline. It says... Uh, they want Gail King and Charles Barkley, not two separate shows on the same show. And I was like, whose idea was it to pair Gail King and Charles Barkley? Gail King on her own? I get it. Charles Barkley on his own? I get it. Gail King and Charles Barkley together? Like, that's not a combination that really makes sense to me. Clearly, they're trying to get black viewers. As a black viewer in the demographic? No. No. What are y'all doing? It says they want Gail King and Charles Barkley to host a weekly primetime show for the network. They said that the Wall Street Journal has reported that the deal with King is being finalized and sources say the talks are ongoing with the two personalities. Look, your ratings are down. I understand you're trying to do wild shit. You're trying to shake things up. I get it. I have two suggestions for them. They're not going to like either one of them. One, take Dawn off that goddamn morning show. Don Lemon is not for morning TV. Don Lemon is a snarky, witty mofo that likes to drop the occasional profanity. Don Lemon, try though he might, cannot give you morning giddy. It's just not who he is. And we don't want him to be that way. We only want Don Lemon giddy when he's drunk on New Year's Eve. Put his ass back at night. And apparently he's been raging on people, cursing them out. He's got a sour disposition. It's not for him. Y'all trying to make that man something he's not. And he's trying to do it to keep a damn check. Put that man back on nighttime. Your ratings will go back up. You're not going to like my next suggestion either. You need to call Chris back. I know y'all fired Chris. I know Chris is suing y'all for an ungodly amount. I know Chris left and tried to bomb the whole network and take everybody down with him on some Nino Brown shit. I get it. I get totally why y'all wouldn't fuck with Chris Cuomo. Y'all want good ratings or no? Not only do you bring Chris back, you bring his brother back too. Y'all put them on a show together. Let them be uber liberal New York Democrats. Accents and all. And let them have a free for all. You get your ratings up. I'm not saying it's ethical. I'm not saying it's moral. I'm saying do you want ratings or not? Bring back Chris and get his brother too. Also, CNN doesn't need a morning show. It's just not what anybody ever tuned in to CNN for. It's just not. Go back to the shit that was working. Go back to the shit y'all were doing before the ratings tanked. The other issue I was reading about is like CNN is trying to be more moderate. And I was like, don't nobody want no moderate CNN. Nobody asked for that. You can tell me I'm wrong. And you can keep doing what you're doing, but your ratings are going to continue to tank. I'm telling you this as a viewer. I spent the first two years of this podcast and my father actually said something to me about it. And he was like, you don't get paid by CNN. And he was like, and actually, when you do TV, you do more MSNBC than CNN. You should talk about MSNBC a lot more because they're the ones who bring you on the network and promote your shit. Point taken. The first two years of this podcast, 
every single episode, I was like, well, yeah, I was watching CNN and this happened. I was watching CNN and this happened. I was watching CNN and this happened. I was a loyal CNN viewer. During the day, at least, I would get up and I would turn on CNN. I would watch CNN all day and all night. And now I don't even watch it. Y'all wouldn't try to fix something that wasn't broke. So put it back how it was, damn it. There was yet another school shooting in America. Do I need to say America? Because nobody else shoots up schools like that. When I was researching this, I think I was on MSN.com. I was reading this story. There have been 13 school shootings in 2023. That's just school shootings. That's not mass shootings. There's a mass shooting literally every day. But school shootings, 13 in just 2023. It's, It's not April. We're still in the first three months of the year. This time it was an elementary school in Tennessee. Three children killed, three adults. There was some back and forth, which, I was, which was very confusing at first, about who the shooter was. I kept seeing the person listed as a 28-year-old former student. And I just assumed, like, you know, most school shootings, that it was a white man. As it would turn out, the person who did the shooting is a transgender woman. If I know America like I know America, this is about to be open season on transgender people. We're going to try to find every single thing to correct and blame for this incident other than the actual guns. We'll have conversations about video games. We'll have conversations about rap lyrics. We'll have conversations about TikTok and social media and and single parenting, specifically single mothers because single fathers are superheroes. But single mothers are, are just degenerates leading to the downfall of society, particularly school shootings. We will have a conversation blaming literally everything except guns. We will do everything except limit access to guns. I always love to refer to this mind, and I wish I could remember the person who said it. And they were like, after Sandy Hook, when those little tiny rich white kids got shot up at school, and then we didn't do anything serious about gun control then, it was the moment where America was like, if the kids die, they die. That's just, that's that's what we do. And people be like, oh my God, that sounds insane. That's what you're saying. What are you doing? Nothing. America, specifically right-wing America, is about to have a whole conversation about transgender people and how they are the downfall of society and they are prone to violence. Conversations that they've never had about all the straight white men that have gone and shot up all these schools and movie theaters, events, like conversations we never have about white men. But there's about to be a full-blown press on transgender people. One transgender person out of all the transgender people to sit around and mind their business. To my knowledge, this is the first time there's been a transgender person who's done either a mass shooting or shot up a school, either or. White men do it every day, literally every day. Mass shooting, every day. I know it's about to be open season on transgender people. I feel terrible about that shit. One trans person went and did some dumb, violent shit and all trans people about to be labeled. They was already on trans people's ass anyway. Anybody who just doesn't conform. Like, America's so fucking weird. And it's not just us. Because the other thing that I wanted to talk about is what's going on in Uganda. I don't know if they're covering this in the States, but it's a pretty big news story on the continent. I think I read this on Al Jazeera. Let me look it up. Uganda has had some pretty fucked up laws on the books about the LGBTQ population for a while. So Ugandan lawmakers just approved a recent bill. The the president hasn't signed it into law yet, but they put forth this bill. It's been approved called the Anti-Homosexuality Act. And Al Jazeera describes it as harsh penalties for anyone who engages in same-sex activity. It's a little more than harsh penalties. It specifically bans, quote, promoting and abetting homosexuality as well as conspiracy to engage in homosexuality in addition to same-sex intercourse. So what that means in like layman's terms is to even identify as LGBTQ could be a crime in Uganda. And the severe penalties that they mention are life in prison for gay sex, and something that they're referring to called aggravated homosexuality could get you the death penalty. 
So aggravated homosexuality is gay sex with people under 18 or when the perpetrator is HIV positive. Al Jazeera lists among other categories according to the law. I think there's also something in there about rape. I think if it's a same sex sexual assault, then it's also the potential for the death penalty. Because Uganda's government has recently passed this, um, this bill, and again, it's not been made into law, they are kind of the new face of homophobia, if you will, in Africa. I think I talked about this on here because I got a lot of questions about it. So I think I brought it up and that's where the questions came from. But Ghana was on the same shit right before I moved. They were trying to make it illegal to be LGBTQ in Ghana as well. Like it could land you in jail. There was a lot of pushback against it. So I don't think it went through. But I'm just mentioning that because I don't want to single out specifically Uganda as if like, oh, Uganda is on some next shit. No, 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 no. It's actually illegal to discriminate against LGBTQ people in South Africa. South Africa has some of the most progressive LGBTQ laws in the world, I think. But I also think it's worth noting, and this is also on Al Jazeera, same-sex relations are legal in 22 of Africa's 54 countries. So the vast majority of them, no. But in 22 countries, less people believe the whole continent has made being homosexual illegal. That is not the case. 22 of Africa's 54 countries, it's legal to have same-sex relations. In the other ones, not that 22, same-sex relations are often punishable by death or lengthy prison terms. Not so good. Al Jazeera also notes that Africa accounts for nearly half of the countries worldwide where homosexuality is outlawed. So as of right now, this bill, again, is not a law. The United Nations and the U.S., called on the Ugandan president to to reject this anti-gay bill. And as of right now, nobody knows exactly what he's going to do. Amnesty International has also called on the president to reject this bill. I don't know. I mean, there's what the world is asking them to do unless there's sanctions. I don't really think they care, to be quite honest with you. I have on this list that we could talk about Jonathan Majors or we could talk about Snowfall. I'm going to hold off on discussing Jonathan Majors. I mentioned before what happened, the accusations. Everyone and their mother has been talking about this. Every major media outlet has got multiple stories about what's happening with this case. As of right now, it's the accusation from the woman. He has lawyered up. He's clearly hired crisis PR. The lawyer has responded that he is innocent. His lawyer has said that the woman who accused him has written two statements recanting her accusations. This incident, a part of this incident, happened in a New York taxi. Jonathan Major's lawyer says she has statements from the cab driver that, that proves his innocence. She also says there's video from the cab. There's video footage of, of the incident in question, which will clear her client. I will say this, though, just because Jonathan Major's lawyer says that there's witness statements and that the taxi driver said this and that my client is innocent and there's video doesn't really mean it's true. I would just like to use a very recent example of Tory Lanez, who swore up and down, I didn't shoot her. His lawyer, my client didn't shoot her. And we will present evidence that will show my client is innocent. These charges will be dropped. My client did not. We have testimony from X, Y, Z, blah, blah, blah. Just because the lawyers say my client didn't do this and we have witnesses that say and we have this and we have that. Maybe they do. Maybe they don't. Okay. I am at this point going to talk about last week's episode of Snowfall. I am going to speak freely and there are going to be excessive spoilers. I've held on to this for almost a week. This is your opportunity to cut the podcast off now. I am now going to talk about what happened last week on Snowfall and the death of a major character. First and foremost, fuck Louis. Secondly, fuck Louis. Third, fuck Louis. I can't believe this chick. The only reason I ain't calling her fully out her name, I'm, I'm going to chick, is because I really respect the actress in real life. But the character she plays on this show, fuck her. 
She got Jerome killed. Broke my damn heart. I knew he wasn't going to make it through the end of the... I'm about to tear up just talking about it. I cried for Jerome like somebody I knew died. Maybe because I know a mean Joseph, like the actor in real life. You hear my voice? Did you just hear it catch like that? Oh my God. I cried like he was real family. I've known, quote unquote, known that Jerome was going to die since... I think it was the final episode of season three. Remember they did this whole episode that was like snowfall in an alternate universe. There's this very specific scene when Jerome goes to see Scully and there's a body on the ground bleeding out. Man boy is going by and he has like an AK-47 or some sort of automatic rifle and he's shooting it up into the air. And it's almost like he's a cartoon gangster where he's like, he doesn't even realize the impact of like spraying this automatic weapon, these bullets everywhere. Like it's just, it's just uber, uber violent. And the look on Jerome's face was horrified. Everyone else is moving around like this is just normal. Like seeing this body here is normal. Firing off these weapons, doing drive-by, shooting AK-47s is normal. And Jerome just looks around like, what the fuck is this? And it's the first time I'd seen Jerome look bewildered. He never really wanted to go into selling cocaine, crack, when, when Franklin first comes to him with the idea, Jerome is like, no. Louis is the one that goes behind, gets her then boyfriend's back, and, and decides, okay, Franklin, I'm going to help you. But Jerome was like, nah, I sell weed. I don't do nothing harder than that. I'm not in. But Franklin got in, and Louis got in, and Jerome knew just enough about the streets to go in with them and be like, let me, help, let me make sure these folks don't get killed doing this dumb shit. But I knew when I saw Jerome looking bewildered, I was like, he doesn't make it through the end of the show. This season, season six, and I watched this episode earlier today because I knew I wanted to talk about it. I knew for sure Jerome wasn't going to make it like 100% when he went to the diner with Franklin and he gave his backstory on how he got to L.A. He told Franklin and he, he sits around and he wonders how he fucked up so bad for Franklin. He called him a bitch ass. He called him scandalous. He called him something else too. Like he just uttered disgust for Franklin. And then Franklin gets upset with him. Actually, uncle slaps him twice. Franklin gets upset and he pulls a gun on him. But he can't shoot unk because he's unk, right? He couldn't kill him. And he shouldn't have. Go back and watch season six, episode two. Like the last five minutes. Unk looks disappointed that Franklin didn't shoot him. Unk dies in episode six. In episode five, there's an incident. He goes to see... Hollywood. And Unc knows that people are trying to kill him. Like they're at war. And he stands outside all day reminiscing with his friend. And I was like, oh, he's ready to die. He wants to die. He leaves the auto shop. He goes to the liquor store. He just stands out. He stands outside. He's leaning on his car, just drinking, getting fucked up in the middle of the day. And I was like, oh shit, he's about to die. He didn't die that episode. I said, okay, he's got another couple episodes. So the top of episode six he comes home drunk. He, he and Louie get into an argument. But he says, I'm done. I'm out. And he was like, I'm packing a bag and I'm moving to Jamaica. And I was like, oh shit. Oh shit. He going to die next episode. And he's sitting there having a conversation with Louie. And he was like, we have to end this shit. Like, wh- what are we doing? He tells Louie, like, I can't do this. And she says, I can't leave. And he says, what is so important to you that you can't leave? She goes on this tangent about how, you know, like, you know that I'm running this shit, but everybody thinks that you're running this shit. Like, they look at me basically as eye candy. And he asked her, he said, are you willing to die for that? And she says, self-worth? Yeah, I'm willing to die. And I was like, you willing to die over the opinion of some niggas in the street? You deserve to die. And that's when I was like, oh shit, like, Louie about to die. And I was like, I was fine with that because she'd been on my nerves for a minute ever since she double-crossed Franklin and then be like, I don't know why he's so mad at me. You went and stole his connect. Unc is sitting there telling her he wants out as his wife. And he was like, do it because you love me. She gets hit on her beeper and she was like, yeah, we got to do a drop, a drop or a pickup, one of those. And Unc was like, oh, I'll do it. And I was like, oh shit, they about to kill him this episode. I knew he was gone. I didn't know how he was going to go. I didn't know it was going to be literally saving Louie's life. That ending, that ending, it wasn't even Louie crying over her husband's body. 
That wasn't what got me. It's when Leon came in the room and saw Uncle on the floor. He had his hoodie on. He pulled his hoodie back and he went down. He didn't fully kneel, but he went low. He squatted. And I took all of that as a sign of respect. And then Franklin says three words. He, he walks around the room and he goes to sit in a chair. He says, unk. He says, unk. And on the third unk, his voice cracked. And I was like, woo. I got chills. Like that's one, because that's how I felt about unk. But then two, that's some good ass acting right there. I've seen the next episode of Snowfall. The one that airs on Wednesday. I won't give anything away. I would just say that there's. Damson Idris does this thing. It's, it's maybe eight seconds. It's, it's not even maybe. I counted it. I watched it at least 10 times. There's, there's this eight second bit of acting that he does. It's better than I built this brick by brick and bodies, 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 bodies combined. He's a genius actor. He's so good. So good. You'll know it when you see it and you'll probably rewind it. It's the best of his acting for this entire show. I was proud of him. As an actor, watching that eight seconds. It's just, ah, uh, it's, ah, uh, ah. Uh. All right. I had to get that off my chest. I feel so much better now. Is there anything else I need to say about Snowfall? But Louie's not going to die, even though I think she should, even though I want her to. Louie's probably going to end up locked up. Teddy must die too, but Teddy's not going to, unfortunately. I don't think we've seen our last death on the show. I would put my money on Leon. Just because he came back from Ghana, I think actually Franklin's mom or Louie end up in jail. I'm still going with Franklin doesn't end up in jail, but also doesn't get his money back. And old girl leaves him. So he gets to be alive, but he's left with nothing. So it's like you went through all this shit over whatever span of years Snowfall covers. I think it's four or five. But you went through all this shit. Kills your neighbor slash father figure. Got his daughter hooked on drugs. Your dad is dead. Your uncle is dead. Your best friend is probably going to get killed too. The second one. Because you shot and killed the first one. One accident, but still. In season one. Your girl's going to leave you. You're not going to make any money. Everyone that you care about is going to be inaccessible. And you're not going to have no money. And I would imagine. If the streets ever found out that he was working with the CIA, that he'd be considered a snitch, so he's persona non grata in the streets either. But I feel like he's going to be alive and left with nothing. I feel like the direction of the story is going real Michael Corleone at the end of Godfather 2. Like, he's left with nothing. (sighs) God, I love this show. All right, that's it. I'm going to edit. I'll be back on Friday. I definitely have Wi-Fi. Will I be sober enough to record at the end of the day? We'll see.